Welcome back, Pedro. How are you? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me. And sorry, I'm, I'm a little late here. Uh, better late than you know what. So, <laughs> uh, you know, what, why don't we start with the Fed? So um, to me, um, when they cut rates, Pedro, you know, I, I thought that we might have, you know, sell the rumor by the fact and yields might bounce back a little bit. But uh, this little did you know. Yeah, but I mean, a trough to be a launching pad for maybe four seven or higher. If we start closing over four twenty, that's something I haven't seen before. Have you? No, and it goes to show you why financial journalists should never give financial advice. Because a friend of mine texted me after the rate cut, and she's like, "Yeah, we're thinking about you know getting a mortgage, and I just got married and." And I'm like, yeah, well, rates are going to keep falling. You know, I just and, yeah. <laughs> and two weeks later, I got to text her back and be like, you know, they'll keep falling over time, <laughs> not over in the time. immediate yeah. future. I mean, I don't know what the Fed, you know, must be making of this, of this, you know, dichotomy of cutting 50 basis points and then having the market basically raise rates by almost three quarters of a point, right? Well, um, yeah, yeah, 65 bips from the low or so. Yeah. I think it speaks a little bit to uh, the uh, dysfunction of the rea reaction function, if you will. Um, I think, you know, in part because of the level of uncertainty that we're living through that is outside of the Fed's control, they have had to be <clears throat> more reactive to single data points than uh, sometimes as broadly data dependent as they they say they'd like to be. And so, you know, some people would say they overreacted to that job market weakness that we had around July and August. It, of course, then got revised away. Um, the chair clearly had a hard time pushing through that 50 basis point cut. It wasn't just the, uh, the dissent that we got from Mickey Bowman, but we also saw in the minutes that there were, you know, a significant number of other officials who would have preferred to go 25 and who thought that 25 would communicate a more kind of normal and gradual and less panicked path of rate cuts. But they did, in fact, start with 50. And yeah. and then we were hit with a bunch of great economic data that showed it, that, that suggested, you know, that took us even to speculation of a pause, which I think is sort of overdone in the other direction. Okay. So, uh, is it possible that, uh, you know, that it just was a policy error again? That, uh, I mean, did we see uh, the financial version of Bush landing on an aircraft carrier mission accomplished by Powell? Uh, is that the kind of moment we're having here? That's an interesting way to put it. I mean, it definitely felt like a, a mission accomplished uh, summary of economic projections. If you look at the way yeah. that they're looking at the economy, it's definitely a soft landing scenario. Uh, but in a way, it's hard I mean, to say. He was, he was tap dancing up there. It's true, but it's hard to say it's a policy error in the sense that it, it, even if it makes them kind of um, take their foot a little bit off the accelerator, you know, in terms of like if they, if they start easing a little more slowly, I don't think – I think the idea of going 50 was that like they couldn't actually commit a policy error at that point because of how widespread the agreement is that policy is overly tight for the current setting of the economy. Yeah. And so going 50 just gets you closer to the level you need to be at, regardless of whether you thought that level was four or four and a half or three and a half. And so I think that's why it was kind of okay to go 50 at first, even if it wasn't the best communicated uh you know policy decision or or is it this pedro that the market is call uh, really singing the tune for the fed um that the market um on this breakdown from 420 uh led the fed's decision to ease okay the the action was here and no one knew a half for sure uh so the market was already there and now the market is uh, projecting maybe a pause here um, instead of more cuts at the next meeting. So you think they're going to go quarter, quarter uh, into the end of the year? I do. And the reason I think that is this kind of similar logic that I just explained to you is that, first of all, it would look kind of goofy to go 50 
and then pause, right? I think yeah. the last time they did 50 and then paused was at the end of a cycle where they were doing, it was the 50 basis point was clearly like okay. an Your end to the cycle. And, okay. and so to start with a 50 and then pause would look like you were being erratic. Um, and again, they, they generally agree that they're away from neutral, even if uh, there's disagreement as to how low that might be, a significant disagreement. And so, you know, I think everybody, even if people are, there is a couple people like Raphael Bostic calling for a pause publicly or, or pondering a pause publicly, the majority of people could get behind another cut if Powell pushes for one. And I think he's likely to do so. So I would expect another couple of quarter points, uh, probably another quarter point early next year. I mean, of course, a lot could change if the election somehow leads to yeah. a reconsideration of the inflation outlook. Yeah, but with the baseline that we have now, I think we get another cut early next year. We get to around, you know, four, four and a quarter. And then there starts to be more serious debate as to like where neutral is and how accommodative they are. And then it starts to get more difficult. But I think okay. from now, I think they're, you know, they've started easing and they're going to keep going. Okay. So here we are for four and a quarter on the 10. Yeah, so, it's amazing. Uh, you know, maybe a lot of that's... Uh... I think that we could get a pullback in yields. Uh, do you have any comment on anything you see in the foreign exchange arena, Pedro, that, uh, you know, we have Japanese elections coming up, not only ours, but Japan. Uh, any view on what's going on there? With the well, yen? I want to, I, I'd like to get your view on what's happening with the yen. I mean, is it is it is the issue that basically the, the market's betting on, the market's betting on uh, on less aggressive Fed easing and the idea that that the BOJ yes. is on a tightening path. It's just, is it really just a rate differential play? What's happening there? Uh, I well, I, I think that this last action was a squeeze. Yeah, and that this is just going to be just correcting this decline. So I'm looking for a continuation of this from in this area here. Hey, hey, Dale. Okay. Um, yes, hey, good go morning. Ahead. Uh, Dale, I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't want to interrupt. I, I just want to. Hey, Pedro. Uh, welcome to Face. So glad that you're here. I Thank love you. always always uh, listening in when you're here. Um, I did want to mention one thing that our team has been talking about is that there is an election in Japan over the weekend, right. um, and with the LDP and whether they're going to get a, a majority or not, and then also. Um, you know, it, it, Ishiba might be pushed out and then you have uh, another prime minister potential coming in. And yeah. so that there's a little bit of nervousness. And so with Dale, what Dale's talking about is squeeze. And then with the elections this week, and I think it's kind of compounded the move uh, yeah. lower in the yen over the last week. So that makes sense. And then and we've got dueling elections in addition to your point to dueling monetary policies. So that yes, that yes. sets us up for a lot of volatility. That makes yes. sense. Anyway, sorry, I'm going to I'm going to let you guys continue on. No, there's a question in the chat that I wanted to address, which is the, the question about whether Trump keeps Powell if he wins. Um, I think oh, it's really relevant now. Right. Um, so I think the idea there, you know, we've been discussing this a lot and exploring possibilities with people because, of course, it's all unprecedented. So it's all kind of exploration of legal scholarship and what the limits of presidential power and. Uh, it's kind of interesting. There was a story in the post recently about him potentially trying to demote Michael Barr. I think uh, he's definitely going to be like you know vocally pushing for a policy of lower interest rates, right? Um, and trying to supercharge growth if he wins in some way. I, but institutionally, I think at least initially he would have difficulty pushing Powell out unless he really just wanted to go. Because the board doesn't have any openings right now. So as I understand it, what he what Trump could do is he could he can fire Powell as the Fed chair, but not as a Fed governor. Um, and so Powell, the board is full. Powell would remain as as a board governor. And then they would have to elect a pro tempore uh, chair who would likely be chair Powell anyway. And so, and similarly with Michael Barr, I don't think he can, maybe he can demote him from the vice chair for supervision role. And certainly Trump is likely to scrap any like Basel proposals that like enhance capital rules, right? I think that's like yeah. a top no, item on no the agenda. international agreements. Exactly. And there's a, that, that's the reason why Basel isn't going anywhere soon is like if when you have that looming threat of it being 
you know, uh, obliterated by one of the candidates. You have to wait for for the election at least. So, so that's where we stand with that. Um, I do think the Fed would be. I do think the Fed would be resistant to pressure. I do think elements of the Senate who would have to confirm potential Trump nominees that would be very acquiescent to Trump policies, uh, you know, might give him difficulty in his last cycle. He couldn't get some of his nominees through. Right. Uh, I think I'm thinking of Stephen Moore and uh, yeah. Judy Shelton, some of his more controversial nominees. Uh, so there are safeguards, but as we as we've seen, the safeguards in this country tend to be less set in stone and more based on norms. And and with Trump, you know, being the norm shatterer that he is, um, I don't think we can take Fed independence for granted at all, especially given the level of the debt and all of the uh, all the entanglements that a large balance sheet and a large budget deficit create between the, the monetary and fiscal sides. Uh, Pedro, uh, Paul Tudor Jones said in a recent interview that uh, whoever wins better have a very good Treasury Secretary and an excellent Fed Chairman to get us yeah. through what, what we're going through. Uh, do you have uh, that view as well that really, the, uh, you know, that a lot of things are going to come home to roost after the election, just like uh, what fell on Obama's lap, right? The great, really, right after he was in office, we had a crisis. Could everything, the sugar high that we've been on uh, with easy money and we're still a bit restrictive, come home to roost after the election? And then all the news that might have been suppressed that's negative about the economy starts to come home. You know, Dale, I actually don't know. I'm actually on the fence about this because there's, you know, the more I talk to the very smart sources that I talk to, you know, all around the central banking and macro communities, there is this deep sense of like macro optimism based on like possible productivity gains and and AI and yeah. and just how fully employed the economy is that I think that at least initially, I could see things sort of coming home to roost a couple of years into the next administration, whoever it is, you know, as, you know, as time goes on. But I feel like the initial impetus is actually going to be the, it might actually be the opposite. And then here's my argument. So we're having really strong growth and, and really stable economic performance in a year where we should have a lot of turbulence and volatility just because of the election itself, right? The level of uncertainty should be suppressing economic growth in this normal cycle. So you could actually get a dynamic where you get a relief rally and a relief kind of, you know, a relief boost in economic activity just from the settling of uh, that uncertainty. In Would addition, whoever's the new... Yeah, and whoever's the new president... Trump. What's that? Wouldn't there be more euphoria with Trump? From a market standpoint, there might yeah. be, I think, yeah, yeah, from a sort of equities, you know, immediate yeah. standpoint. But from a general growth standpoint, it might work both ways, right? Because both candidates would have, uh, would at least try, depending, of course, on the, the layout of Congress, but would they would try their best to boost growth in their first couple of years. Uh, and they would go all out in whatever ways they can to to boost their bottom lines social, you know, kind of infrastructure and social spending on, on the Democratic side and tax cuts on the on the Republican side and, and deregulation. So I think the initial impetus, and I, and I learned this lesson, honestly, from the last Trump administration, I thought that Trump would win, and there would be so much kind of political and social acrimony that it would lead to depressed economic growth. And in fact, the opposite happened. So I think that the initial chances are actually the initial risks to growth and to, you know, sentiment post-election are to the upside. And then we could get things, you know, coming down the pike like CRE and other financial stability issues may be coming down to hit us later on. But I don't think it's going to happen in the immediate future. Well, our tariffs, uh, you know, history rhyme with it being a contributor to the depression in the thirties? I mean, is there anything good about having a tariff policy? 
certainly not a blanket one that is like you know i i i don't there's very little consensus i think the trump argument is that he's really just a lot of it is Average. just bluster. yeah it's bluster and it's sort of like you know fear the unknown and and it's kind of the same argument he makes for national security like you know nobody knows he's he's wild he could do anything at any time so we're not going to do anything that's kind of the case that he makes about himself on foreign policy and I guess there's, you know, there's a world in which that kind of real politique might work, but the chances for terrible outcomes and progressive retaliation are just enormous. And yeah. we're already so, uh, so aggressively pitted against China, especially on the national security front. If you just right. add that trade dimension to it, which is, of course, very national security related because it's really all about the chips for weapons. Uh, it just it's unlikely that it would resolve itself very easily and that the, you know, the the bluff would just work and, and China would suddenly, you know, play by the rules of the game. I don't see it happening. And I guess the Democratic case is that they, they apply tariffs, but they do it a little bit more selectively. Uh it's the, there. There's not that much daylight in terms of trade policy between the two, other than you know. Although I, I, th I would argue that the the real daylight between them in terms of trade is the approach to immigration, right? Because the ele the other element of trade is labor, and uh, the real shock to the economy could actually come from the immigration restrictions rather than the tariffs, because that would truly be mass deportations would truly be a new supply shock at a time where the labor market has finally fallen back into balance to use the Fed's lingo. So that could be truly problematic. And the Peterson Institute has some pretty eye-popping numbers as to the inflationary effects of that policy if it were to be implemented. Are, are you concerned that there might be a, an oil shock after an Israeli retaliation? Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm getting not that concerned about it because I, I'm surprised that there hasn't been an oil shock. It seems like the supply demand equation has changed in a sort of secular way. Cause if you, if you had told any of us on this call, just any details of the conflict that we are currently witnessing in the middle East, and you had asked us to ballpark oil price, yeah. I don't think any of right. us would be in the vicinity of 60 and 70. Right. Yeah. We would be talking about like 150, 160. And so, I find it hard to imagine anything out of like a full blown, you know, military conflict between Iran and Israel and, and actual attacks on the oil infrastructure, which I don't think the US and Israel want to do because it's counterproductive for them. So short of that, I don't see I don't see it happening. It's definitely a risk. And I think this yeah. it's something important to keep in mind is in terms of the Fed's mindset, is that Fed officials are increasingly convinced, and we've written about this extensively that they have defeated inflation to your point about mission accomplished. Right. Okay. Uh, and so they're, they're increasingly sanguine about upside risks to inflation in the existing outlook. The only upside risks to inflation that they see are sort of shock driven things that, that are sort of outside of the immediate yeah. purview of their forecast. So. Okay. So, yeah. Um, you know, commodities are, are acting pretty good. So, um, yeah, it's kind I of amazing. What, I don't know what message that's giving, given, but normally higher commodity prices <laughs> are inflationary. Exactly. Well, but you know, you never even with the tariffs. Uh, you know, I heard a couple of interesting analyses recently. Like, it's hard to just prejudge the effect because the tariffs, in and of themselves, are inflationary, right? And you could yes. call them tax. But right. if there is a trade war, it could actually be depressive. Chief, it could be stagflationary, yeah. right? So. Um, it's difficult to tell. Can I ask you, uh, were you aware of a bank in Oklahoma recently shut down? No. I, I think it was, um, yeah, regional. I forgot the name. Uh, oh. And I, I heard um, from Melody Wright, uh, who's you know does housing stuff, that uh, on, they only guaranteed 50% of uh, deposits. Oh said, man, that that's, like, a, that's a really interesting story. Thanks yeah, for pointing that out. I'm gonna yeah, so uh, I think it happened yesterday or the day before. Yeah, it was two days ago. Uh, that would, you know, I said, well, that sounds like a bail-in. Yeah, and she said it's. They explained that it wasn't. 
but they were only backstopping 50 percent of, of the deposits wow that sounds like a a dangerous so there's a, for, for the kind there's of years a, i'm gonna give you a, a scoop all right buddy even though it's a day old <laughs> and that's, I mean, the scoop comes when you dig into the details of what happened right <laughs> so, yes. i mean that's that's a story because yeah, I mean, there sure. are there are stories about the plan failures of all these regionals next yeah. year. I mean, it's part of the plan, but I don't think uh, the public uh, would be happy with only fifty percent of their deposits. No, I, absolutely uh, not. And, it's, and it sets because we're so because we're so uh, in the dark about everything uh, about no about the specificity of deposit insurance. Yeah. Like any precedent that's set becomes like the new precedent, right? Yeah, because they took away that emergency facility that they instituted with SVP. Exactly. Yeah. Anyway, uh, something to look into. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know. After uh, talking to Melody, I, I think that housing, she lays out a very cogent uh, argument for. There's going to be uh, a problem with housing, and that what yeah. happened in what happened in uh, Florida uh, accelerated the problem. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, a lot of things to look. I, I'm so glad that I get to talk to you every quarter, uh, Pedro. Because it's I think, always a uh, pleasure for me as well. Know, so thank yeah, you. Yeah, you know, me. I mean, the, I think we're going to have a uh, uh, very, uh, uh, you know, volatile on many levels, not just markets, uh, a lot of things to keep our our people aware of. Um, For sure. Not just yeah, markets, and, but on a human level. Yeah, and you're you know, you're a great ambassador for explaining what people don't understand. So I just want to thank you for your contribution to our community here. My pleasure, Dale. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So we'll we'll speak in January. You have a great holiday and uh we'll see what kind of world we're looking at in 2025 huh buddy i know in two weeks even <laughs> <laughs> yeah awesome. anyway, good yeah. luck everybody yeah, Happy yeah thank you pedro thank Thanks, you buddy everyone. pedro to cost and you can follow read his writings on mni and follow him on x at p de costa and anytime you're confused about what's going on uh pedro you can see has uh, more than one wheelhouse, more than just the Fed. So uh, that's a wrap, everybody. Uh, hope you enjoyed Pedro. I know I learn every time I talk to him, and uh, he kind of gives me balance for my negative outcome proclivity. So <laughs> <laughs> thanks for cheering me up, buddy. And, Pleasure. Uh, thanks again. All right. And don't just count your pips. Count your blessings, everyone. We'll uh, wrap up the week, TGIF, tomorrow. Dollar's coming off. I uh, think uh, uh, dollar's going to be a great buying opportunity near 102. So that's my uh, you know, narrative in the dollar. See everyone tomorrow. Adios. Thanks, Pedro. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Hey, traders. This is Blake Morrow with Forex Analytics. Thanks for stopping by our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like these videos share them, and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of the content that we provide here for free. Thanks for stopping by. I'll see you in the next video.